welcome to the Arcadia University Culture Global Studies lecture series. I'm delighted to introduce uh, Peter Lynch from the University of Stirling. Um, he's uh, got a, an interest in Scottish politics and specifically the Scottish National Party and the history of the Scottish National Party. Uh, he's just had an edited anthology um, articles dealing, dealing with the issue just come out and then a book I think uh, was republished, is that right Peter? Um, um, can you remind me of the title? It's a very exciting SNP, the history of the Scottish <laughs> National Party. Right. So there you, go. You, can, you can tell the publishers choose book titles. <laughs> so it's, it's, what it is. So it's a very, a very literal title. Um, I'm sure all of you are aware that you've come to Scotland at a truly astonishing kind of moment in terms of political discourse and the ideas that are swirling around uh, given the upcoming referendum in days. Um, so depending on uh, which way it will go, it will be a uh, you know, very interesting moment in Scottish history. So I'm delighted to have Peter to be able to come in and speak to you a little bit about, about politics and the upcoming referendum. So thank you, thank you Peter. Um, it is a really strange time you've come, actually, in some ways. <laughs> it's a strange time because you've pitched up just to the bit where everyone's trying to register as many people as possible to vote as well. Um, and it's been fascinating because I didn't, I didn't imagine yesterday part of the day would be spent running around trying to make sure my daughter had registered. Of course she hadn't. So form, run, get, oh, panic, oh, and off you go to, to do it. Um, and that's been an interesting phenomenon in itself in Scotland at the moment, the fact that um, there's a lot of voter registration going on. Now, you might assume to yourself this happens normally, and some of it does, but not on this kind of scale. There's a lot of people who are either not registered, who are registered, who don't vote, <coughs> and there's quite a strong mobilisation going on amongst people who don't normally vote to get them on the register and also make sure they turn out. And that's quite new in the UK. It's something that the political parties talk about, but I'm not entirely sure they do it. So they talk about how important it is, but actually doing it is another matter because it involves going out to what you lot might think of as a project and registering people. And that's one of the things that's been going on. So there's, there's, there's sort of stories within the story of the referendum that are quite curious. And running around registering people is one of them. Um, and also voting is also something because I voted last night by post and I posted it in the letterbox and I felt very excited to be able to vote. It's a funny little ballot paper. Um, in the UK, at different elections, we often have long ballot papers that aren't as long as yours are, with everything on it, from president to dog catcher. Um, <laughs> the joke goes. But ours are usually longer, so I opened up this thing that's been sitting, you know, behind the mantelpiece for a week. Right, because I didn't want to vote in my own way. I just said, yeah, you don't want to do that. So I went up to my mum and dad, so open this thing up, and it's this little slip. <laughs> so rather than, we've got this, this little kind of thing, and it was, it was just, you know, I don't know if it was a sense of anti-climax or not quite knowing what he was going to say because I knew what the ballot paper said. I remember it from two years ago when they announced it. But there you were suddenly confronted with it. Um, so when you've pitched up here, you're, you're throwing yourself into a referendum with lots of registration stuff going on and you'll meet people who've voted already. So when you say to them, oh, how are you going to vote? They'll, they'll say, I voted already. Um, and not only have they voted already, they've probably taken a picture of it. And some of them have tweeted it and put it on Facebook, which I'm not sure whether that's legal or not legal. It's a real, yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure, I'm not sure the electoral laws, uh, like many laws, envisage what we were all going to do with technology and photograph everything and tweet it so the whole world can see. So there's a slightly odd thing going on um, that you'll see when you start to I have two friends in Scotland that, wait a minute, the referendum's not for two weeks away, people have already voted and here's the ballot paper and I'm sitting smiling away in a mugshot doing something. That's the kind of uh, thing you've, you've got going on. So it's really, really, um, it's a curious period as you see it roll out in the next uh, couple of weeks. Um, how much you'll be aware of it is, is, is very interesting because you might think to yourself, if you read the papers, you might get some of it. If you're, if it's who you're around and who you mix with. If you're with international students all the time, you might not realise the stuff that's going on. I mean, you might involve you know, trips to other parts of Edinburgh rather than the centre to really see stuff and realise there's a campaign going on, because campaigns are like that. Um, there's loads of it online, fear it in the paper and the TV, but lots of it's on the streets, but it's whether you're actually somewhere where you can see that. 
and that makes it a little bit more. So you may, in a couple of weeks' time, oh, yeah, that referendum, we only need climax. I thought it was going to be a lot more visible, didn't see any. Um, but that's because you're, you're perhaps stuck right in the centre of Edinburgh, where all the international students are, who guess what? They're not voters. So that's not where the action is going to be. So, um, you know, seek out some of the stuff and, and go and have a, have a look at it and chat to some of the people because they're all quite fascinating. The reasons for yes can be good or slightly absurd. The reasons for no can be good or slightly absurd too, depending on what you make of them. So you get all sorts of things kind of coming out. Um, now, today the, um, I, I brought a prop with me, which we might refer to as an educational tool, which I've never used before. It's, it's a newspaper known in the UK as the Thunderer, the Times. The Times of London that thunders on and tells you. Um, and the reason for bringing it here is not uh, for any other reason that this is the Scottish edition where they're reporting that the polls are almost equal for yes or no, um, which makes the whole thing for the next couple of weeks more dramatic. So the story of the referendums before has been of yes, quite some way behind, catching up a little bit and stopping, catching up a little bit and stopping. And now they're, they're yes is 47%, no is 53% going into the last sort of 16 days where, like many voters, there are late deciders, there are people who still, oh, I'm going to wait until the day and do all this. So there's a lot of fluidities perhaps still to come. So um, mostly when you have referendums, if you're losing all the way through, you'll lose at the end. This referendum, yes, has been losing all the way through and now they're catching up and they're almost caught, no campaign. So I don't know whether they're going to win or lose. Um, and there's no point in asking me because I, I, really, I really don't know who's going to win, win or lose. But you're in that period where it's quite an exciting race, and often in politics that's not what happens <coughs> in politics. You know who's going to win, they win, and that's the end of it. Here, you've got quite a bit of drama to come because the two can't win. You know, the, 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 uh, the tortoise has caught the hare, essentially, in terms of the referendum campaign, in terms of public opinion. So it's a curious kind of moment. Now, um, one great question in your head is, how did we get here? Uh, not how you got here, because you came here by airplanes, right? Um, how did Scotland get here to this moment? And <clears throat> in some senses, um, it's by accident. In some senses, it's by design. Um, uh, people in the SNP <coughs> uh, who wanted a referendum on independence um, planned for this moment. They didn't plan for it to be now, necessarily. They planned for it in general, in the future, at some stage. If you'd asked me when I thought this referendum was going to be, I, I, I wouldn't have told you now, I would have told you maybe in 10 years. Um, so um, something that you know the SNP planned for, thought about how, how a policy and a strategy or how they're going to do it, arrived much more quickly than they thought it would. Now of course when something arrives like that and an opportunity arrives, what do you do? You go, oh, no, no, we won't take it, oh, no, no, they went for it. <clears throat> um, um, and, and the accident the accidental part of this is, is them unexpectedly winning to get the majority of the 2011 uh, Scottish election. That's the trigger. Now, how we got here goes back a lot further than that into the rise of the SAP, the challenge to the other political parties, why the other parties uh, talk about the issue of the Scottish Parliament and Labour eventually creates one. So there's a whole backstory going back into history of knowing that something has been growing and growing. But of course, you only know that, you don't really know that at the time. You know that looking backwards, you can see, oh, something's really developed here um, and, and changed. <coughs> and I suppose the moment we're in now, the change is, isn't so much about the SNP, it's about everybody else um, engaging with the issues and uh, some unlikely people becoming yes supporters for independence, meaning you not know, the SNP people, meaning other people. So, you know, one of the stories of the referendum is, is um, about Greens, Socialists, Labour supporters, and even Liberal Democrats, meaning people in completely other parties, deciding, oh, I like the sound of this independence, and I like these bits of it, and starting to move. And if there's going to be a yes, that's, that's why, because it's engaged lots of other people rather than just um, the SAP voters. Um, um, you know, one of the stories of the referendum over time is, is the growth of Scottish nationalism and identity. And I don't mean that in big flag-waving terms. You can find it in everything. Um, uh, friends who used to uh, come a while ago from Catalonia would wander around places like Edinburgh and be struck by, you know, flags, you know, football shirts, badges, everything. You know, Scotland, 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 everywhere as a sign of identity. Now we're all very cynical about that. That's the short red tin 
view of Scotland where these are nice products for tourists to buy, but actually we buy more too than wear them. Um, that's grown as a sense of Scottish confidence has grown and people being more political about it. Now when I say more political, I mean you're thinking about more powers, thinking about devolution, thinking about culture, music, identity, anything else. So there's a whole range of things going on here that you can see slowly developing. It didn't mean they were, they were coming to this moment. There was nothing inevitable of having a referendum or an SNP victory or anything else. There's no kind of history. It's all moving this way. It's not like that at all, but you can see things um, moving towards um, uh, more engagement with, with Scottish issues and, and a desire to have more, more powers uh, for the Scottish Parliament. Not necessarily everything, but more. Um, let me say about, about the economic and, and social context of where you are now too, because in a sense, <coughs> you wouldn't, um, economically, you wouldn't choose now to have a referendum to set up a new country. You wouldn't. Um, you're trying to win. Um, um, and the reason for saying that is, to, is because of the great financial crisis. Um, the issues that are around in the referendum, um, particularly from the no campaign about currency, um, banking, markets, all those things have got traction because of what's happened in the last six years. They just wouldn't work out the same way. We wouldn't be, you know, you wouldn't have all this discussion in the campaign about um, what does the Bank of England do? Do you have a central bank? All these kind of all bank regulation stuff. You just wouldn't have it in the same way had you not had what's happened in the last six years. And that's really shaped sort of one side of the campaign's approach, knowing that you know people are nervous about the finances. Why? Because everything went to hell in a handbasket. So, so they know that. They've seen their wages, they've seen their pensions, they're worried about you know, their savings, they've seen all those kind of things happening. And they realise, mm, yeah, okay, these, are, these aren't abstract issues that might occur. They just happened in the last six years. So that's pushed a whole lot of issues onto the agenda. Um, um, that's made it difficult for yes, but better for no, to prosecute the case and put forth certain arguments. Um, but politics and, and, and social issues are also important too. They go against them. Um, one of the things to, to, to know about Scotland but don't exaggerate is it's a bit of a centre-left um, country. We'd be Maine, right, if this was the United States. Um, you know, a bit greener, a bit more left-wing, etc., etc. Now, people talk about this as, as if it's true. It's a bit of a myth, but when you see who people vote for here, you realise, oh yeah, they vote for the centre-left. They don't vote for the Conservatives. It's one Conservative MP of 59. That didn't happen by accident. Could you imagine in the United States there's only one Republican? If you're in Canada, if you're be interesting. Canada, yeah, you can remember <laughs> that there was almost very few Conservatives in Canada at one stage when they got wiped out. Um, but so when you're looking at Scotland, that's your kind of thing. And because of the last sort of six years of the financial crisis and the governments who've been in, what they've done is push social issues up. The agenda. So, what do those? What, what are those? Well, you know, uh, benefits for people. Um, you know, unemployment, disability, the thing called the bedroom tax, um, money for pensions, the welfare state, the healthcare, education, blah blah blah, everything. And those have all become much tighter. So, if you, if, you know, if you've got a centre left electorate who cares about those things, they're not so keen on what the UK has been doing for <coughs> six years. Um, and some of them are really not keen. He's been uh, last year. So some of the yes messages, if you like, are specifically to them to talk about those kind of issues. Um, and one of the fascinating things in the campaign, when you realise what's going on, when I, when I was talking earlier about the projects and who's campaigning the projects, is yes who's campaigning out there. And those people would normally vote Labour and they're being detached from Labour. Um, to what party, I'm not quite sure, but that's a big challenge when your core electorate moves. But the political context is also important too. This, this takes me back to non-conservative Scotland. Um, the referendum <coughs> was pushed back to 2014. You could have had it any time between 2011 and now. It was pushed back. One of the reasons was to push it away from uh, recession and the great financial crisis. But it was also to push it towards the next UK general election, um, where you realise the context of when something occurs will influence it. So let me give you a, this is a, a voter who I met a bit, of Edinburgh, a bit of West Edinburgh, um, who's a, a former Liberal Democrat voter. He says, this is what he says to me about the referendum. He says, oh, you see, I don't really want independence. I want more powers for, for Scotland, but that's not really been offered. But if I vote no and the Conservatives get into government in the May election in the UK, I'll never forgive myself. And that's the Scottish voters' dilemma in a nutshell. 
and it's all because of when the election is. If you do this, what do you think? Can you separate out from the next events, political events? No. Um, you know, and if you'd said to the SNP <clears throat> five years ago, um, you're going to have an independence referendum, do you think you're going to oh, no, you won't have one of those, will we? Yeah, and you're going to have one at a time of a conservative-led government run by um, the economic and social elite of the UK who went to Eton and to Hawksbridge and are millionaires and they all run the cabinet. It's, it's like going back to the 1950s in the UK. If those are your opposition, how would you feel about having a referendum? Most of the SNP people would probably think, oh, actually, I quite like the sound of that. So the wider shaping thing about the politics of what goes on at the time is quite influential, although the economic one bashes against it. So, you know, it, the, what's the no campaign got on its side? The great financial crisis. What's the yes campaign got its, on its side? The Conservative government has issues to use. And those work in Scotland. That's the whole point. They work here. In other places, it won't work. People will just look at it for what? But in Scotland, that will work um, because of the kind of things that it throws up. Um, I suppose another kind of thing to talk about briefly is <coughs> this is referendum three, okay, um, about constitutional change in Scotland. So you had one for devolution in 1979, another one in 1997, and this one in 2014 about, about independence. Now all the referendums are linked, they're about different things. This one is certainly different from the other two. Um, but there's all sorts of similarities in what the campaigns talk about, what they say, who campaigns at all. Like Alex Salmond, the First Minister, what do you think he was doing in 1979? He was out in Livingston in Linlithgow and all the places out west of Edinburgh campaigning for a yes vote in the 1979 devolution referendum. And there's loads of people like that. So people who you see now, unless they're your age, obviously, if they're older, they've been through three referendums and they connect them and they talk about them and lots of voters talk about them and connect them too if they're above a, um, above a certain age. <clears throat> and what's funny about this referendum compared to the, certainly the 1979 one, they're talking about the same stuff, about the economy and jobs being lost and um, oil running out um, and all sorts of other issues that they use for devolution in 1979. So there's a real sort of continuity in some of the issues that come up again and again. Now, you know, when I say that in your head, you should be thinking, are they endlessly recycling the same arguments for and against? Yeah. <laughs> and that's fascinating about political campaigns that they do this. Because when you're around long enough, you hear it. You hear that the things that were going to run out, they should have run out already because they said they would. And that was 20 year old way and you start to get muddled. So but that's political campaigns. Right? Campaign, yeah, campaigns say things. Um, and and they, they, you, can, you can trace them and, 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 and look at their genesis and how long they last. The two campaigns at the moment are, seem superficially similar. Yes, and no campaigns seem similar, but they're actually quite, um, quite different. And it's always funny when you meet campaigners um, to try and figure out who, who are they actually, who are they really, where are they from, what are they doing. And after you meet campaigners of your age, um, do ask them if they're being paid to do it. Because that's always quite revealing. It's like, are you guys doing this for nothing because you believe in it, or are you kind of believe in it and you're getting paid? Money to do it too. And it's a fantastic thing. So, if you meet people, ask, just ask them, how much you get paid to do this? And watch their face. If they say they're moving and they look shifty, you know they're being paid to do it. And it's, it's a real insight into what, what's a grassroots campaign. Yeah, and, and, you know, both these campaigns, yes and no, kind of are, think they're following the Obama model for from 2008, right? Of, of having individuals recruit lots of people to join a campaign, having a bottom up campaign, using social media to campaign and that, all that kind of things works. Now, you've kind of got bits of that here, but you've kind of got different things too with a lot of top-down stuff and a lot of stuff funded by, by people who have an inordinate uh, amount of money so that they can give money to a campaign and not have to worry about how much money that, that actually is because they've got that much of them. Um, and I know this, I know this one, <laughs> this one, one person in particular who's, who I, I gave her all my money um, and she's now spent over the campaign. I gave her all my money to buy children's books. So you have to unravel who I've just suggested that is. She's like, I don't know who that is, but you figure it out. Um, the similarities of the campaigns are kind of in how they try to engage voters, how they try to have grassroots stuff. And they're doing boring stuff that you may be familiar with, like putting leaflets through people's doors, um, telephone canvassing, which I'm not sure particularly works, because if somebody phones your landline, if you have a landline, you're not going to answer, are you? 
to somebody who wants you, you can answer your profile, um, tell you whether you want to speak to them or not. So you've got back to them, and you've got an awful lot of old style door knocking. So the campaign you're looking at is, is got all this quiz bang, you know, demographic, uh, so, uh, social media stuff going on um, to, to widen the reach of all the organisations that are involved. But it's also just got old school stuff that anybody would recognise. Knocking on your door, hello, have you decided about the referendum? In, in engaging in the conversation and shoving leaflets through their doors. So you've got this sort of combination of, of styles uh, going on. Um, but in some senses, the two different campaign groups depart. Um, the Better Together campaign is, is relatively conservative in what it does in terms of this. The Yes campaign, you can have anything. Right? If you have a Yes campaign event, what do you think you're going to get when you pitch up there? Um, you might get speakers speaking with an audience, you might get performance poetry, you might get music, you might get, um, you, you might get modern dance, which I've seen and I have to say I don't really understand. Um, you can get all sorts of things. Um, and that's much looser in the, in the Yes campaign in terms of what they do and the kind of things that they, they pick. Um, there's a thing that some of them ran called Yesival, um, where they went around Scotland with lots of different artists and creatives, as they like to call them. Um, uh, holding events, <clears throat> so you know, a bit of music, a bit of poetry, a bit of you know somebody would come along and read from one of their books, and it, you know some of it were brand new people you've never seen before, some of it were the, you know the big authors, the big uh, you know, the big artists, the big musicians. So you had all sorts of things going on, and and the, that's much more difficult. To, that that's kind of a, a that's an odd type of political campaign. It's a much more fluid, much more open one, involving all sorts of things that maybe better together have done. But it tells you about the personnel. And, and a little bit about um, how, uh, how um, you know, it's much more fluid and difficult to control centrally. Um, I guess a final, kind of, a final kind of thing to, to say about, about picking through the referendum and how to understand it. Um, I guess there's, there's two types of things to sort of explain about what's going on, and this will sound slightly odd. Um, the Yes campaign want independence, but they don't. Okay, and you think, what on earth does that mean? They want a version of independence that is as if they're renegotiating a confederation within the UK. Okay? Now, how does, why do I say that? Well, because they want a social union with the rest of the UK, they want to negotiate a currency union, so share the currency with the rest of the UK, and they want to have the Queen of Head of State and have a whole series of agreements that make the UK look kind of UK-like instead of completely independent. Now, of course, that's not what the other side say. They'll say it's, you know, they'll use the, sort of the same language as, as they've used before. But it makes it a curious kind of offer, if you like, if you're a voter, because it's independence, and it, and it isn't. It's kind of, it's what you call independence light. So it's got some things that you can say, oh yeah, that's independence. It's got other things that, well, they're not independence. Now, I say that knowing that I'm not actually sure what independence means anywhere. It's quite a qualifying topic. So if you're a purist about an issue, you quickly find, well, I'm not really sure how that works, that it is all that pure. For which I offer you France, independent France, that shares a currency with, guess who? The Germans, Spain, and Ireland, and lots of other places. You're like, well, okay, is that independent or is that? And that's the, that's the qualifications, just to think through what's really on offer here and, and what does it actually mean. Um, uh, it doesn't mean necessarily what you might think it means. It's just a bit more of a, of a sort of a confederal idea. The other kind of uh, thing to think about is is, is ideology, <coughs> um, and that coming in and out of the referendum campaign itself. Um, the two campaign groups um, are, are quite different. Okay? Yes, it's fairly ideologically coherent. It's centre left. So they can talk about certain issues, they'll disagree with each other a little bit, but they're pretty coherent in what they say. So you get a coherent message about social justice, about the economy, etc, etc. You get varieties within it. The other side, better together, are not ideologically coherent at all, and that shapes the messages they can make. And it, that's a problem for them, um, about what they can say and what they can do. And it's a bit of a, dis, a disjuncture. Now, the reason that matters is because the big battleground of the referendum is in fact Labour voters on the centre left. Um, so yes, it's ideological coherence helps them to talk to those voters and to try and drag them away from 
move towards yes. And better together's problem is they've got Labour people in better together saying, come, you know, stay with us. But they've also got people who they don't agree with the Conservatives and Liberal Democrats in the same campaign who can use <coughs> types of messages. And that's a bit of a bit of a muddle. So when you're looking at some of the better together uh, messages <coughs> and posters, all those kind of things, they've got a problem because of who's, who's involved in their campaign that softens what it is that they can say and makes a real problem. From at one stage, Labour set up its own campaign group, um, united with Labour. Um, so you know, you're part of this campaign and you've split away from it at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, okay, there's a good unity message because they realised their voters couldn't listen to some of that stuff from Better Together because it wasn't strong enough and it couldn't be strong enough because the, the three parties in it disagreed with each other on all sorts of issues. And it's just a real problem how they've, how they've, um, how they've dealt with it. <clears throat> but it's, it's, a, it's a key kind of thing because Labour voters are, are a big part of the electorate and if they shift to yes, there'll be a yes vote. If they stay with no, there'll be a no vote. Um, um, and the demographic is quite big and it's quite important. So that's where a lot of the stuff you see, you think you've got this big wide referendum campaign going on. It might seem like that, but actually there's quite a lot of focus on one electorate and moving it from here to there or the other side, trying to keep it there or trying to drag it back. And then that's where a lot of the, that's where a lot of the action is um, politically in terms of the messaging coming out from the different countries. Anyway, I'll, I'll stop there and take some questions because you may have some questions. <laughs> so you say that they want a social and currency union, but what exactly would be independent about this Scotland? Like, like would it be similar to the United States where each state has its own government, but they're still unified uh, by DC? Or that, 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 I mean, that's kind of what you call devolution now. And the thing about independence is it will still have some of those things where they'll agree things with the rest of the UK. Because it's a funny kind of scenario, right? You think to yourself, right, you, I'm in Scotland, right? Here we are, we're in Scotland. <coughs> we're bolted on to England. And we're always going to be, right? You're always going to have people back and forth. You're always going to have that kind of thing. You don't have a border. You have a border with a signpost on it. That's it. People just wander up and down. Um, and you have all sorts of links between them that people buy, sell, go, go to university down south, as I did, went to London School of Economics. That all has gone on, and most of that you'll probably st still think will, will still go on. And the, your question is, how much powers? And so, you know, the, ye the yes offer is kind of, um, right, you want your own state, your own membership of the European Union, you want to be a, a member of NATO, you want to be a member of the UN, um, uh, you want your own army, you want to run your own economic system. So you want all those things, that, and those sound like hard state, like independence things. But then also, we want to share stuff with the people next, next door, like currency, and you're like, oh, oh hold on, how do, you, how do you do that? And that's where, the, that's, where the, that's where some of the conflict is over the issues about whether you can share them or not. But it tells you an awful lot about the history of the UK, that that's what they're, you know, that's what, the, that's what yes is suggesting. So they're suggesting, a, they're suggesting a moderate version of independence. They're not saying, right, you know, we're going to be radical, we're going to have our own currency, we're going to have a Scottish president, we're going to build a big wall on the border, um, which some of you will realise people have tried before, um, not us, not us. Um, so you've got all that kind of stuff that you think nobody's going to want to do that. So, so you're getting a version of something and being presented as, as independence. And it's, it's like all sorts of things, it's a compromise. It's not a purist version, because I'm not sure the purest version of, of independence exists anywhere. If it, if it did, the Chinese wouldn't own all your bank debt in the United States, would they? <laughs> oh, oh, wait a minute. You've got all that kind of thing with the interlinked economy. So the complexities of, of modern statehood are sort of there in the, in the yes plan. But it, it causes it difficult, it causes them problems. Cause you, that's not independence at all. Why should you vote for that? And then yes, people have to think, oh, yeah, how do we explain that we're offering a qualified version of something rather than a pure version? Cause, cause People may have a rather hard view of what they think a state is, even if it's, there's not very many in the world to do that. Um, anyone else? Questions? Questions? How long would a moderate independence take to come about rather than total independence? How long would moderate independence like, come into being? Like, how long would it take? Uh, great question. No, no idea. Right? 
So I can tell you officially what the government say. Um, uh, you know, the referendums in uh, two or three weeks. Um, if there's a yes vote, the, the SNP government plan is to have negotiations with the UK and other organisations within 18 months so that they're ready to go at the end of March 2016. Now, you, yeah, you see, you've got to set a timetable and you've got to have an independence day and you've got to have uh, a day when it all starts to happen. Will they be finished negotiating everything by then? No, probably not. Um, and it's going to be fun. Uh, it's yes, what, what are you going to get out of it? And you, you know, if you've ever been to Vegas, you know, it's a card game, right? A negotiation it can be a card game. You've got aces, they've got aces. You're in a negotiation to get this and get that, stop that. So some of the stuff in terms of how they're going to negotiate it, some of it will get done in 18 months, some of it they won't. And that might be good or bad. You know, I, I, I don't really know, but that's their, that's their timetable. Um, now, it's a funny thing, right, because you think, God, 18 months to do stuff, but then you have to think to yourself, do we need to set up a university system? Ta da No. Do you need to set up a, a government and parliament? No, you've got lots of that already. Do you need to set up a health service? Do you need a flag? We've got two. A national anthem? Well, I've actually got three. I mean, I don't like any of them, but there's three of them, right? So, it, Scotland's a funny place, right, because you've sort of got semi-statehood in all these institutions. You're not starting from year zero. We need to do everything. Um, I'm not saying that because people will do it. I don't know if they're going to agree to this or not. But it's, it's, the transition thing is, is what the SAP talks about and how much they can negotiate in 18 months. And some of that will be good, some of it will be bad um, in terms of what they can get because it's currency, oil money, agreements about common travel areas, all sorts of things. Trident. Trident, you know, the whole lot. They won't do that in 18 months. Um, there was a great thing, there was a great uh, spoof that one of the politicians talked about um, the UK having to sell, uh, if Scotland became independent, have to sign 14,000 international treaties. Think, oh my God, 14,000. But it turns out some of them were countries that no longer existed anymore. Uh, there was a spoof website about 14,000 treaties, which was, you know, treaty so and so with Alaska to take it back from Russia. So, wait a minute, that's from, yeah, exactly, <laughs> from 18, oh, okay, that was true. So, there's a lot of that kind of stuff. Because you know there'll be negotiation stuff. If you, if, you, if you came to Scotland and you worked as a lawyer, this would be brilliant for you. <laughs> all these types of things. So you've got those types of things to work through, but that's what countries do. Now, a new constitution. New constitution, all sorts of things. She's like, they're never going to get that done in 18 months. Yeah, of course they're not going to get done in 18 months. Yeah, but some of it might get done, some of it won't get done. And you, that's, 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 if you're a voter, you're like, well, how much is going to get done? And, and in a sense, it's how much are you happy with? What's the direction of travel? If you know, I, I'll take that, that, and that. That one will have to take longer, and that's what you go with because that's that's life. You don't all become millionaires straight away. It tends to happen more unless you. you know, what, what were you going to say? Um, what do you think relations hypothetically? Let's say there's a yes vote. What would what do you think relations with the EU would look like in terms of Scotland? And then, from my understanding, the Queen would still be the head of state, but Britain tends to distance itself from the EU in a lot of matters. So how would that work out? The EU's got a problem in that it doesn't have a, it kind of has a way for Scotland to be a member even though it's already inside. But that's one of those areas of contention about how do you actually do this when you're already inside it, how do you become a member. So it's got to deal with that legally and also it's got to deal with it politically between the different member states. Um, and for the people watching in Barcelona, they'll realise there's a big link between the decision on Scotland and then what might happen in Catalonia and how those things all match up. The Catalan one's even funnier because they already use the euro. Um, so those things are a bit of a muddle. The, 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 what happens afterwards is curious because, you know, an independent Scotland, what's it going to do in Europe? Who's it going to form alliances with? Is it going to be with the people next door on some issues, which it probably will be? Will it be other states on other sorts of issues? And you don't know because it will do what everybody does as a state in the EU. What do we get out of this? What, what interest do we have? Or oh, we'll, <coughs> oh, we'll do it that way. Um, so you're not quite sure, but getting through the, the sort of the legal muddle of, 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 uh, of becoming an independent state from the inside is the first sort of problem, the, the issue to, sort of, to deal with. Because that's a, that's a, I don't think it's, an, it's not an unsoluble one, but it's a problem one because it's constitutional, it's political. I mean, the, the strange thing is, um, 
you know, if, if Scotland votes yes, I'm still in a European Union citizen with European Union rights because they've given to me in all those treaties and they can't take it away. It's a, a real muddle when you tell us, like, well, hold on there. So the, there's an additional muddle there about what, what kind of happens. But the politics afterwards is going to be fascinating because you, your question is really what do states do in the European Union? How do they deal with each other? How do they, what things do they support? What things do they oppose? And what side payments do they get out of it by doing certain things? What co coalitions do they involve themselves in? Um, and you'd imagine Scotland, you know, kind of be like the others there, trying to figure out what, what deal can we get that's going to help the economy here or society or something else uh, out of different European Union legislation. Um, does Scotland have the answers for any of this? Or are they doing it on the fly? Yeah, both, I think, probably both. Um, You'll find lots of the idea, yeah, the, the thing is there's lots of answers for some of the stuff, but some of them you haven't tested yet. So the European Union one's untested, um, because nobody's, you've had countries kind of, you, you realise the European Union has made things up as it's gone along too, <laughs> um, and negotiated things. So that's a curiosity of, Lord, okay, how's that exactly going to work? Um, and I imagine if, if, if Scotland votes yes and it becomes an EU member, they'll try and shut the door on that process happening fairly quickly. So that nobody else can get it, because um, they realise, oh, oh um, what can you, you know, how, how to deal with that? But it's a curious kind of set. Those kind of things are curious because you, you think them through and think, right, okay. They, they give you an example. There's a bit of stuff this week about 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 uh, somebody, a, a general who just he'd been involved with working for NATO, a UK general who was talking about Scotland. Scotland won't be able to get into NATO, and you have to politically unravel that and think what that means. So it's like. Let's, let's imagine you're sitting in Mons in NATO, uh, in the big NATO base at Shape headquarters. Um, what's on your plate at the moment? Ukraine, Russia, Georgia, right? And them applying for members. So politically, you're engaged with all that militarily, trying to deal with it, basing your forces in Poland and Lithuania, Estonia. And while all that's going on, you're going to you're going to refuse Scotland being a member, right? So. Any of you study international security, you'll realise, whoa, hold on a minute. So the bit bolted on at the end of the UK that's got the nuclear weapons, you're going to say you can't join whilst you're having it. And you realise this is just a bit mad, it's a bit absurd. Um, and, and, but that's the kind of discussions you're having in the press at the moment. You have to think, rethink them and think, yeah, that's a bit, you know, I'm not sure that's really a good idea if I was NATO saying, no, you all should go away, we're not going to let you in. But we're going to have these guys into your border in Russia because that's a really great idea and spend the next two years dealing with that. And you think politically, mm, uh, mm, I, I imagine some of Obama's staff members will be starting to think through, hmm, I can see problems here if we take that kind of approach. Um, because it sort of mucks up the whole idea of security in Western Europe. So, you know, with those types of things, that's how you, you, try, you try to think them through and think, wait a minute, you really want to do this? Um, and the EU's got a bit of that too. That too. What do you want to be in? What do you want to be out of? And what's the ramifications if an organisation says no, you can't come in? Is it good for them? Is it good for us? What is it? Um, and th those those become fascinating when you actually think them through. Thinking because you're seeing campaign rhetoric. You see, that's the problem about things. You, and when you think them through, you know, I don't know if that's a great idea at all. Not the waterway across the north of Scotland is crucial. Yeah. There's all sorts of things that are just like. Mm, Oh, every Scottish citizen I've talked to, basically now, they're wanting to say yes because they're worried if they say no, like they'll become very boxed in and everything will just be worse for them. Do you think that'll happen if there is a no vote? I don't know. It's fascinating though, isn't it? Um, um, I mean, it's a, it's a funny kind of... Uh, people are aware of the constraints of it, right? The risks, the uncertainties, the problems. Of both sides, and that's back to the, what happens if if you say no. What happens here? You know, you've disinvented yourself. I mean, yes, campaigners will say, "Oh no, disinvent yourself as a nation." Whoa, 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 have I just done that? Like, whoa, no, I'm no longer a oh, god. Um, no football team. No, whoa, 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 whoa. Um, and it's funny, right? Because that's psychologically that's a curious kind of thing to do. It's like let's have a referendum to disinvent yourselves as Americans. It's like, yeah, that's going to go down really well. <laughs> it sounds absurd, but those things are in play in people's heads because there's people who are going to go in on the day and not knowing what to do. They're going to be standing in that voting booth perhaps for some time. 
Because they don't know what the backup's going to be. If there's a no vote, you might get more devolution. What's it going to be like? Is it going to work? Is it going to enjoy it? But then it's what happens to the economy, what happens if it's a Conservative government. All those things crowd into people's heads because it's a, it, that's the problem with the binary choice. You know, if I lose, if I lose, what happens? Or if I win, what happens? And they're not quite sure. Um, so they're all having these you know, slightly existential debates within their head. Enjoy it. What is, what is people agonising? Because they'll talk about it. They're all talking about it. A while ago they weren't talking about it. Now they're all talking about it. And I sit in the, the local pub across the road from me. I sit there and watch the food. And I can really quietly hear these people oh, arguing about it. And they're engaged in it. And, they're, and some, of them don't, some of them know what to do. And they've always thought this or that. Others are right in the middle. Some of them are in a hole because they don't know what to do. Because it's such a what will happen and what should we do. And they're not, they're not quite sure. So it's a real, I mean, that, that's, it's, a, it's a fascinating thing to observe as long as you're not feeling it. <laughs> what were you going to ask? Um, so I've been reading like some of the newspapers lately and I know that in a lot of them they always talk about how some of the conservatives and the Tories are moving like further right and how there's like a the gap between the yes and no is like closing. So, is there any correlation between like, are more people wanting to vote yes because like people are becoming more conservative in the political? Topic? This is a version of your question about Europe, right? Because <clears throat> um, overhanging this debate is is the rise of UKIP down south. I mean, UKIP did okay here in the Scot uh, the European elections, so they got someone elected, which is. Well, a surprise for some. I wasn't sure I was all that surprised, but um, but it's a much bigger phenomenon down, down south, meaning in England, connected with English nationalism, etc. So the two things get off each other. It's as if you you know you know you wake up on the day, referendum day, the person that you're talking about who doesn't know what to do, you open up the newspaper and there's an opinion poll on the front that has the Conservatives in UK. Um, winning lots of seats in England with the opportunity of Nigel Farage and Boris Johnson being leadership. And you just ask this to people in Scotland, what do you feel about that? And you'll, you'll see a Vesuvian reaction. Okay? And that's the kind of thing overhanging the referendum. You know, political developments elsewhere. So Scotland's mostly vote, not, you know, not completely, but mostly vote for centre-left parties. When the right is on the rise in, in parts of England, um, they, those two things get off each other because some people will make the connection of, you know, it's like, the, you know, so what does the political future look like? Oh, 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 and you realise that's not what I think at all, in fact that's an, ext it's an extreme version of why, why I don't think, not a moderate one. So the, the two things get off each other, as is the European referendum, because um, there is a bit of a, the, f the funny thing about um, about, this is one of the comedians in Scotland has this wonderful way of uh, distilling an issue because he tweets a lot, distills it into one issue. His, his argument is this, right, so Scotland's going to be forced to join the Euro if it becomes independent, even though it won't be able, able to join the European Union, and it's been told us by people who want <coughs> the UK to leave the European Union. And there's your model of Europe. You're exactly, your face is going, how does that all hang together? And those are those kind of that's those issues clashing off each other, and it makes it really, really curious to sort of understand and get to grips with it. Um, but I mean, I think you know, for for yes, the UK growth has been is great for them because it's the alternative future that doesn't look very attractive. And the rise of Boris Johnson is interesting, the mayor of London, because he's on record for saying he wants the Scots to have less political power. So that's devolution in reverse, which is would be inconceivable. Uh, within the Scottish electorate. I mean, it's tough to control these things in campaigns because they just come at you. So, you know, there's sometimes... I, I remember back in, in, the, in 1997 when it was the second devolution referendum and um, I was... I had no idea what I was doing. I was sitting doing, working in, 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 in yeah, the Scotland Forward office, so the Yes campaign office, um, way over in the new town. I have no remember. I was doing something completely banal, you know, type, 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 folding leaflets, you know, something really high powered and intellectual. And somebody came running into the room and said, old STV journals came running in. Quick, quick, come and watch TV. We've won. And this is like two weeks before. So you go through and um, 
Margaret Thatcher, um, a name to use sparingly in Scotland. Um, Margaret Thatcher was on TV and she'd come up to Glasgow and um, she was standing next to William Hague slightly and, and the, the, all the media, because you know media can be very difficult, they're all shouting, Mrs Thatcher, what, is there a message you'd like to give to Scotland about the referendum? And, and she, if, if she, you, know, you can see William Hague's face, oh, don't speak, don't speak, don't say anything. And of course she says she speaks, oh, um, you know, some Scots must vote no, devolution would be terrible. And, and that was a message that lots of people were like, whoa, wait a minute, um, they helped the Yes campaign. So you've got those things that they can't quite control that just, that just come up and, and, and shift a little bit of opinion around. Um, now, I'm not sure that's the UKIP or the Boris effect here. There's a bit of it, but I don't know how big it's going to be if it's going to shift people. You've got a question. I'm just thinking over the last couple of years that Whenever I've seen David Cameron talking about this issue, it's as though there, he's not really making an effort to say things that want, make Scotland want to say, and I'm just wondering how bothered is England about all of this? I mean, a lot of English people I spoke to in London last week who worked for us were just like, they don't want to be with us and they can go, you know, they can leave if they want to. And is, how does the, I mean, also with Wales and Northern Ireland, how is the rest of the UK feeling about all of this? Cameron's, Cameron's funny, right, because Cameron's been quite clever about, <clears throat> about the independence issue. Like, the cleverest thing he has done is not have a debate with Alex Hammond. Now, why has he not done that? Because it's, it's far too difficult. Um, now, why, you know, it, 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 and the way to think about it is not, oh, it'd be Scotland versus England. Like, that's one layer. Of it. The other layer is Scotland versus the Conservatives. And then the third layer is Scotland versus the upper classes. Right. It won't take you long in the UK to learn, for Scott to learn how much social class still matters. <laughs> it just, I know, but it just leaps out. <laughs> I know, it just leaps out at people. And you might be aware of it, or you might not be aware of it. You'll sometimes wonder, you'll see an exchange between people and wonder what's all that about. Oh, right, that's the social class thing going on. Because you can, you can see it, you can see it. And it leaps, even the, in the papers today, there's a wonderful thing from a former professor at this institution, which in, in essence was because more working class people are, are, are more favourable than yes, she interpreted it as the uneducated are voting yes. Yeah, but it's like, well, no, I don't think I'd have put it like that. <laughs> and that got widely slid. And that's the kind of thing, you'll, you'll find this kind of things come up. So when Cameron's avoiding the debate, he's doing it because he knows it's not going to work for the Better Together campaign. You know, He's going, to, you know, he's going to come up here and tell Scots what to do, blah, 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 given his social background, his economic background, his elitism, it's not a good idea. So that's why he let a Labour MP be the leader within Scotland of Better Together and do the TV debate. Um, it's just a, it's, it's, it's one of those realities that he knew he just couldn't, he just couldn't get into. Um, well, another very, very absent voice is Tony Blair. Yeah. He has been a former Prime Minister of the United Kingdom went to Fatty's, uh, Edinburgh School, uh, was born in Glasgow, kind of a quintessentially Scottish, tremendously successful politician, but his voice has been zero other than to say, yeah, fatal to so the current crises in the Middle East, his, his role with the United States. That's about the only comment that he's made kind of publicly. Uh, it's a, it, it, po I mean, po it's, it's former politicians being involved in saying things can be good or bad, um, because, Often, I mean, you know, I teach politics, right? But <coughs> I know that people aren't interested in it to the degree I am. I know I am the anorak, and they're not, and they're, they're not going to know who some of these people are. So when people pitch up, I mean, Blair's a big exception, because most people should still know who he is. But they'll just wonder who is this guy, where is he, and what's he saying, and they'll sort of drift away. Um, the, the, I mean, the, the, in terms of what the Yes campaign have tried to do, they know people aren't listening to politicians, and they've tried to get ordinary people to do all the talking and the work. Um, I think Better Together have tried that too. Um, because you'll listen to your friends, right? Even when they're talking a lot of rubbish, you'll still listen to them, uh, your friends and family. Whereas you won't listen to, you know, um, Lord blah blah on the TV telling you something, you switch off from it. So, um, you know, someone like Blair and Tavinian will have some kind of effect in the newspapers for a day, but you're not really quite sure how far they're going to take that, uh, that kind of thing in. Um, in terms of what other, other people are thinking, we don't really know. Polls tell you very different things about about what's, what England or English voters are thinking about Scottish independence or Wales or Northern Ireland, and they're all very, very different. Um, they're tuning in a little bit. I'm not sure they're going to tune in much, because I, 
um, a journalist from um, Ireland, uh, from the Irish Times, uh, Mark Hennessy, who's been over back and forth to do the campaign more than journalists from the UK have been to do the campaign. I'll just throw that little um, it's hand grenade at you to make you realise that's been going on. Um, and he came over, I remember a year ago having, having a cup of coffee with him in, uh, in the Balmoral Hotel. Very posh. He wasn't staying there, he just goes there because it's got free internet. Free wi -Fi. Very clever. So, and Mark says, he says, look, um, the newspapers and, and politicians, they're not going to really take this issue seriously unless Yes gets in a lead in the campaign and stays there, or the day after when there's a Yes vote and it's an earthquake and people realise we didn't see this coming. So, um, you know, he could read that a year ago, watching how, what people's reactions are going to be. So, in, 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 you know, in England, Wales, and Northern Ireland, I, 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 you know, if, if yes stays behind in the polls, then they'll just think well, nothing. Um, if yes gets ahead, they'll have a, a reaction, perhaps. But some of the reaction will be the whatever reaction, because they're not entirely sure how it's going to affect um, their lives, and they might not think it's going to affect them all that much uh, at all. But until you have something like that, people don't necessarily take it seriously. They're probably taking it a bit more seriously today. And today's funny because when polls meet like this and you start to go, you, you, when you're in a political campaign, right, you've had your campaign strategies uh, sorted out for a while, you've spent the money, you've booked the advertising, you've got the billboards, you've filmed the broadcast. So if it goes wrong, how do you change in the last 16 days? Now, uh, you know, there might be an answer to that because something might be about to have to change what they do for the next 16 days rather than just a tweak. Um, but it's quite hard to do so, so late on in a campaign. Because this, this, I mean, if you're from the States, right, you've come to a, pres a presidential campaign. That's what you've come to here. A long, two-year, long, grinding, keeping it going campaign. It's not the UK general election that you usually have of six weeks run quick, quick, quick. Um, it's been you know, growing intensity for a long kind of period, so it's maybe a bit more familiar. But in that sense, it's tough to change some of the things late on if it starts to go wrong, or alternatively, if, it, if, it's, if, it, if, it's, if it's not been right enough um, for, the, for the group that's behind. Um, any other points or questions? <coughs> Going back to Margaret Thatcher, um, every person I ever talked to about um, the referendum talks about her and how like there's more celebration and dancing on her grave than some politicians being elected type of thing. But how much do you think she affects the current referendum, like a election thing? I mean, it's it's it, it, it's funny, right? Because um, you know, on on referendum day itself, so on 18th of September at 9 a.m., I'm standing in front of a bunch of first semester politics students, right, who come from Scotland, the UK. Finland, America, whatever, they're all sitting there. Um, they, you know, they'll have heard of Margaret Thatcher, but they don't necessarily won't have a political reaction to them. If they're from the UK, their parents might have told them about Margaret Thatcher, or their grandparents might have told them about Margaret Thatcher. Um, so it's, it's, but older voters will remember and, and realise, oh, you know, you know, Margaret Thatcher, you think this is a personality of sure but it's also, uh, it, it, here's a little, here's, here's, here's this would be a campaign way of looking at it. In 1979 there was a referendum devolution, it ended up being a no vote. What happened next? Margaret Thatcher. Uh, how long did that last? Well, quite a long time. And, and for some people, the Conservative government, I mean, it lasted 18 years. 18 years. How old are you? How old are you? Okay. So tried 18. <laughs> right? Not alive. <laughs> okay. So you add 18 to the next bit and you realise, wait a minute, that's twice my lifespan. <clears throat> and, and that's that's the kind of reality to that kind of thing. It, it's 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 a it's 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 just a it's a proxy for a conservative government. So if you're a centre left voter, you know, um, how long will this other side be in power? You know, if you're a, if you're a Republican, how many Democrats will be in the presidency for the next? Blah, 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 blah. If you're if you're a Democrat, how how long will the House or the Senate be run by that? It's those types of how long does that last of your lifetime? So, you know, the Margaret Thatcher issue is a version of, wait a minute, what if we do this and it, we end up with exactly what we don't want for a set kind of period? And it, it's, you know, with Margaret Thatcher, it's personalised. Um, and people will remember, people will also tell all sorts of, of jokes about, about Margaret Thatcher. I don't mean rude jokes, I just mean jokes. I mean, it will tell you about how politics shaped them, maybe how they were socialised in the politics. I mean, I'm, I'm a... I'm a, I'm a 
politically, I'm a child of the 1980s, right? When Margaret Thatcher was the Prime Minister. And that had a huge effect on me, and probably has ever since. It's not just the only thing that has, there's loads of other things too, but that's one of those types of things. But if you're, if you're a child politicised later than that, it might not have the same kind of, kind of effect. But it is one of those sort of, you know, big flag, whoop, 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 red flag, warning, warning, Margaret Thatcher um, could be Conservative government if you don't vote yes. And that's how yes will use it, that kind of, kind of thing. And, and the thing about that is, it, it kind of works as an issue because people mm, react to it, in particular the Labour voters realize if we do this does that mean we end up with that or what we actually want and that's their conflict so some of them are having that internal conflict about about that party loyalty who they normally vote for stuff they like about the UK versus what happens if the other side keep getting in and we're stuck with it and you know, there isn't an easy answer to that question for them that's why they're struggling with something. Um, any other questions? about um, since they're all going to be at university here and people their age and how much the change in higher education funding in England has impacted the way Scottish students <coughs> think about the independence issue. It, well, it's always entertaining because because you, you yeah you, you're going to be sitting in classes with people who don't pay any tuition and students who pay a lot of tuition um, and you might be able to figure that out fairly quickly who is who. <laughs> Socially and demographically and everything else, you might be able to fit that. But it's, it's one of those it's one of those issues that will, that will come up from the voters, and I suppose um, that's a contested issue at the referendum between both sides. So the yes campaign will say the only way you can keep free education in Scotland is if you vote yes. The no campaign will say if you vote yes, um, you won't be able to afford free education anymore. You have to pay all this kind of money. So it's a real complicated, kind of muddled type of um, issue. But it, it, you know, you'll find out from the people sitting next to you in class. I mean, don't just well, maybe just how much you paid for this. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with what being a you know having a brass neck, as we call it in the UK. Just have a brass neck. Just have, how much you paid for this? You paid for this. You know, don't don't sort of you know fit around it thinking how do I say this politely? And some of them say oh, I'm not paying anything. It's okay. Who are you? You paid for this. I'll we'll tell you. Oh, I'm paying nine thousand a year. Um, and it's a, it's a UK oddity of European law, why you have the two different systems. Um, but somebody's decided to have fees and somebody's decided not to have fees, and that's why you have two different different systems. Um, and students will tell you, just ask them, so are you a yes for? What, what is it? Because of free education? They go, oh, yeah. Or they might just look at you, there'll be another issue. So you're going to get all sorts of things out of about, about the money stuff. Um, um, and it's, a, you know, it's an issue. How big an issue? I'm not, I'm not quite sure. Trying to think what the students talk about, um, and they talk about that a bit, but they talk about absolutely everything as well. Uh, coherently, I should say, not stern, not kind of rubbish, but they do talk about an awful lot of things. The it, green, the green issues might be more relevant, perhaps the, the green arguments. Yeah, it, it's funny because I think I think at Stirling, like, you know, if you what what's the referendum done right for 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 students is drawn them into politics, which you know, for, if you're teaching it, brilliant. Great folk are finally interested. Um, it's drawn people in on, on Stirling campus. Who's who's big and who's not big? The, the big political group on campus is the yes group. The no group are tiny. The yes group. Who's big in the yes group? You think it was the SNP? It's actually the Greens and the Socialists. They're the ones who've gone up um, and are really, really active. Um, and if you're at Stirling, you'll see them because they're a lot of campaign. If you're at other places, you might see them too. So you've got different types of effects of what people are, are talking about and, and, and uh, making issues in different ways than just thinking it's the SNP saying stuff. They've, they've probably gone up a little bit as well, but you don't see it. It's, it's mostly um, the Greens, the Socialists and the Independents, the people knowing anything. So why do you think the Greens popped onto the Yes platform? Uh, well, they were there already. Um, so, so Greens officially were pro-independents um, for quite some time, since about the early 90s. The arguments are obvious, really. Yeah, I don't, well, with the Greens, you've kind of got um, you know autonomy, self-determination arguments that fit right in. You've got equality, fairness, and justice arguments that fit right in. And there's things they'll disagree with about with other with, with the SNP and yes about the economy um, and certainly about environment, meaning oil, oil versus renewable energy. So you've got those kind of disagreements too. But um, and I think from the Greens, you probably find. Um, two thirds of the Greens members wanted independence. The other third were like, not quite sure. 
um, but you get a year or four, and then you get you, ten years from once you're you're active. Um, and you'll, you'll you'll hear that on campus. I think in Edinburgh, um, you'll certainly hear it. Of all the other ones, I'm not quite sure. Uh, Edinburgh and Stirling will hear Greens, um, but some of the other ones, I'm not yeah, I'm not really too sure how much of that you'll get. Aberdeen will be interesting. Anything else? Think about lunch, aren't they? Don't blame them. A warm room in the afternoon is never a good idea. <laughs> Sitting here with your jet lag. So, do you teach politics at Sterling, like the university? Yeah. The freshman level class? Straight out of school. And it's going to be very entertaining for teaching British politics. So, at 9 in the morning, there's British politics. At 10 o'clock at night, there might be a different version of British politics. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> that, that was slightly terrifying in class. I'm thinking, are they about to lose? Is, is the handout and all the course reading about to suddenly change because people have made a decision during the day? Yeah, yeah, two, two, two versions of that. So it's quite a funny, funny time. Um, people turning up, wrote, pitched on this in the first, the first week. Um, you'll see it here. You'll see people go, oh, what's going on? As they, as they suddenly appear all at once in this referendum scenario. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much.